You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 223 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by HandsOnGloves.com, the all-in-one revolutionary bathing grooming gloves. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have a special format. It's kind of like new for 2023. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month. We're very reliable to that one, aren't we? And I'm excited today because we have the opportunity to listen to a story that affects generations of horses. Well, before we get to our first guest, we always have a little chat about hands-on gloves because they are our title sponsor, after all. And you had mentioned something a little earlier about a mare you had there at the farm that could benefit from some new techniques with the hands-on gloves. Yes, I loved you. We were talking about hands-on gloves being um, so clever. There's so many different things about them that we love. But the one thing this poor mare is always suffering from are the little drip drips off the belly when we wash her. And she's such a sweetheart. She really puts up with a lot. But for her, you can just tell it's like super ticklish, like there was flies all over her belly. And it's not just a little water drops, you know. But even after you scrape her off, you know how the water creeps down under there and it drips a few more times. It drives her bananas. And you told me about a video that showed a guy who had thrown a towel over his his dog in this case. Uh, but, you know, before you put it back in the car, P.U., <laughs> you, you. you get a uh-huh. towel. But for those who, you know, want to really be able to grip the towel and really get a, a good job done of drying the dog or the horse in this case, and I could really reach under a belly by putting on my hands on gloves, grabbing the towel, and, you know, I don't have to hold it very hard if I can scrub under her tummy with that towel and get those last little bits of moisture out of there so it doesn't bother her. We've all taken the towel, and we dry some part of the horse with the towel. Mm-hmm. Well, the towel dries the top of the hair. Right. Right. It it does, especially as their hair gets a little heavier in the wintertime. Yeah, here we are. It, it doesn't it doesn't get down. And it's like trying to wash your hand without using your hair without washing your using your fingertips. It doesn't work. Exactly, Jen. Doesn't that work. that's a perfect analogy because I can't get in there, especially under the belly. You know, it's kind of loose skin and yeah. 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 That's perfect. brilliant. So washing your horse, give them a quick scrape scrape, and you've already got your hands on glove on anyway because you're anyway. using that to scrub your horse. Yep. We'll just grab the towel in your hand. Give the tummy a rub, give the legs. And what a great way to also get the legs and fetlocks and coronets mm-hmm. really, really dry because that's going to ward off scratches. Yes, that's another thing that we can get here in the tall grasses. And she is a pasture horse, but uh, she's she's absolutely lovely. And she loves her spa days and loves her grooming, but she hates her little uh, drip drops. There we go. Her tummy. Yet another, we're going to have to develop a pamphlet, 101 useful ways exactly. that you can use your. I'm telling you, hands. every time you get horse girls together and you talk about hands on gloves, we come up with a new one almost every time. Every time. Well, you can find out more at handsongloves.com or you can find them at your local retailer. Dr. Steve Grubbs is originally from the state of Tennessee, the volunteer state. He's a veterinarian and a diplomat at the College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, Large Animals, and after 11 years of private and referral practice, returned to graduate school and obtained a PhD in comparative and experimental medicine with an emphasis in virology and immunology. Well, welcome, Dr. Steve Grubbs. I'll call you Steve. Um, we've been chatting a, about some some pretty serious stuff, but you're a, you're a fun guy, and it's really fun to have you here. I appreciate you being on Horsemanship Radio. Where do you hail from right now? Right now, I pretty much in the center of the country. I live uh, about an hour north of Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, Originally, that's... I'm from the state of Tennessee, and but I've been here. Oh, 15, 18 mm-hmm. years you know, for yeah. a while. Yeah, I looked you up, and it was November of 2003, so you're about 19 years okay. there. 19, there you go. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. It keeps going. Yeah. And you're with Berner Ingelheim. I hope I'm saying that somewhat correctly for you German fans. Uh, but, uh, but with the Animal yeah. Health Division, and you're the equine technical manager, as we introduced you. But um, you're also a bit of a horsey guy because you end up on a lot of equine technical stuff. What's your horsey background? Okay. Gosh, it, you know, we could talk, I guess we could talk forever, but I guess, you know, a couple of the things, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, kind of raised into it to a point, you know, raised in with quarter horses, that sort of thing, brood mares, mm-hmm. uh, did some quarter horse showing, that, and then I got a little older and, and uh, still working out, always, you know, didn't always want to be a veterinarian, mm-hmm. I think, but it kind of hit me at one time, and prior to that, uh, I actually worked for Bud Anheuser-Busch with the Budweiser Clydesdales for oh, a short you? period, that. Oh. Yeah, a couple of different places here, and actually where you are in, in California. No and, kidding. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that was a while ago. That, that was a while ago, and uh, I'm not sure those hitches are even there anymore. Maybe uh, they are. I, I haven't kept up with them in a while. But, oh, that's uh, a cool yeah. fun fact, though. Yes, yeah, so you like the big yeah. horses. Yeah, it, the big horses are well, yours. Okay. It, it was no, not necessarily. I've owned some, but. Uh, uh, Probably not as much, but I really, you know, it was really a good experience. I really enjoyed, you know, working with those horses, understanding because Anheuser-Busch has a plan and there is the Anheuser-Busch way to take care of, you know, to manage those horses, to take care of those horses. And, and, uh, that's what you do. And it's really a good way. And, uh, uh, so that was really enjoyable. I learned a lot. You That's know, good just to during know. that period of time. I don't so, even yeah, know. Interesting. Yeah, and I don't even know how one person actually handles all those harnesses. It, it's an amazing mm-hmm. amount of weight. <laughs> I don't think they are, any... especially the collars, because the they're collars. solid and they exactly. have all the brass and they're you know, they're they're a one piece collar, you know, a lot of collars you use and horses or mules now you you put them over and, and you know they don't but these horses have to stick their head through and i'm not a real tall person and those are really tall horses yes. and uh, but they learn they know when you're short oh. or right they'll come up oh. and i had to hold the harness i had to hold the collars a different way i was taught that mm-hmm. and because they are really heavy and they will lower their head and help you so, and so uh, they help yeah Oh, they help you a lot. They they taught me a lot there in, in the early goings. And so, yeah, they're fun. Um, they are fun. And, and you've hung in there with them. This is so great. So you stayed in the horse industry, but we're going to talk about some more serious stuff here. Um, sure. I saw where your company, and probably you had a, a great t- deal to do with it, are investing in those researchers out there that are working on equine infectious respiratory diseases and some things about uh, I think you're you're trying to get some people to find out more about that equine asthma. And I have a lot of friends and horse owners and people that we know in the industry who are, they're worried about this, this equine infectious respiratory diseases and asthma. Maybe the first question that uh, Jennifer and I were talking, my producer and I were talking, and maybe the first question to answer is, what's the difference between the diseases and the asthma? Or is okay. there? I hope so. Well, yeah. Uh, in, in general, okay, because a lot of things, you know, in biology is in general, there's, you know, kind of what we, we think about. But we talk about uh, there's obviously the viral infections, there's the bacterial infections and that sort of thing. And we think of uh, equine infectious, you know, disease there. Whereas when we're talking about equine asthma syndrome, because it is a syndrome, okay. asthma itself is typically non-infectious, mm-hmm. Okay. And where we have the, in the infection, you know, they're infectious. We, you know, like I said, we have the viruses and the bacteria, but non-infectious disease uh, is typically not related to that. Occasionally, you'll see some of the clinical signs after that, but let's keep it simple. Mm-hmm. And uh, the non-infectious diseases are usually triggered by something in the horse's environment. Okay. okay? And what that is, it's usually... Uh, the primary source is usually dust from either hay or bedding or somewhere in that environment. Okay. okay. And so now you, you, you kind of separate those and think about how to either prevent, manage, or a, a little bit different, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're telling me a little bit that some of the, the ways that we can 
or the, some of the contributors, the largest contributors would be bedding and hay and, and, and the dust particles in those. Does that lead to both equine infectious diseases too, or is are we leaning towards the asthma part? We're really leaning toward the asthma part, mm-hmm. okay, from the from the true environment, from our mm-hmm. from the dust itself, because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so non-infectious. You know, our primary okay. source is something from the environment. So, uh, can we say that that might be preventable? And and how can I do that? I don't want my horse to have asthma, and if I'm okay. if I've got a dusty barn, uh, what can I do? Okay, yeah, and I think. That is exactly the first way to uh, to think about this. Okay, yeah. how can I manage this? Because the absolute because we all we all want it's 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 the most I want I'm going to say this it's probably the most uh, it's 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 not difficult but it seems at times maybe overwhelming mm. but it, it's really not because every environment is obviously different every part of the country is going to be a little bit different uh, from the East coast to the West coast and everywhere in between each environment is somewhat different. Now by managing those, that is the very first thing we need to do because a lot of times what we want to do is, okay, should we be treating these horses with a certain drug or a certain medication? And yes, that can come, but we really need to look at our environment because without some management and sometimes it's minimal, uh, Sometimes our drugs may not work as well or as long as we want, and we'll get reoccurring problems in these non-infectious, these asthma horses. Mm-hmm. And so what we like to do in is what can we do to decrease dust? And some of the simple things, uh, the, the simplest, if it's possible, and it's not always possible, if you have a horse that stays, you know, in a stall, maybe it has a, a run out, you know, has a run, it can kind of come and go in. Uh, or you have a small pasture, some of the easiest things that you can do if a horse is having a small episode is turn the horse out in the pasture, mm. right? Because most of the dust is going to be, he or she, the horse, is going to be exposed to is actually in the barn. Yeah. And and then, you know, we talk about feeding hay. We're still going to be feeding hay inside or outside. And a lot of times we'll feed hay where, you know, above the, uh, in these particular horses. Now, now we're talking about asthma horses. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about for every horse because sure. it does not affect every horse. And so a lot of times, uh, one, for convenience, and two, to keep the, uh, the hay off the ground and, and kind of out of the sometimes the mess, we'll, we'll feed them in hay racks or bags or whatever hanging up. Well, a lot of that dust is now where is it coming to mm-hmm. on that affected horse right down, and it's inhaling. We call those inhalable particles. And so they'll be inhaling that right at head level. So one of the things in an infected horse is we'll feed hay on the ground, right? And uh, to ground them, you know, on the stall. It's, it sounds kind of bad, but for those horses, you will decrease the particles that they're inhaling. Um, and there's a lot of work out there, you know, sometimes three or four or five or six times, you know, you'll decrease those particles. You know, other things, um, you know, round bells, uh, and so it, sometimes it's necessary. And so there are some things in the environment we may or may not be able to change. Sure. Uh, but round bells, you know, sometimes we can wrap those. We can even get huge hay bags that tend to slow it down. Mm-hmm. That may Because first thing a horse a lot of times wants to do, where's the best part of the hay? And a round bell is right in the center. Mm-hmm. And if you've looked at many pictures, I've seen horses' heads, and all you could see is the ears <laughs> sticking out where they've eaten out the bed and their whole head and so they're inhaling everything. Yeah, right, that's in that true. Bag. They drilled and a so, hole in there, didn't they? <laughs> it, exactly, exactly, exactly. And I mean, you'll see pictures, and, the, and people kind of think it's funny. And it, in some horses, it may not affect. But if you've got an asthmatic mm-hmm. horse, uh, not a good place for the right. horse to be sticking its head in. And so, you know, round bells. If there's a way to get away from those, that's probably always, you know, always the best. And uh, uh, like I said, we talked about the hay nets. And then you talk about the barn itself, depending on how the barn is made. You know, okay. if hay is stacked above the stalls and as we continually, you know, move things, move up there, there's always dust settling down in on the stalls. Okay. You know, as we're cleaning barns, you know, if there is a way to uh, turn the horse out, just simple things, turn the horse out while we're cleaning the barns, yeah. just if we're using like a leaf blower to blow out the dust and things, yeah. don't do that while the horses are in there because it really you know, really, really stirs it up. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, wintertime is a thing where a lot of, in a lot of places, we have a lot of doors closed. We have a lot of windows closed, you know, if and where possible, open, ventilate. Uh, and you, even before, if you have to sweep and you don't use a leaf floor, sometimes you can just, you know, maybe not when it's below freezing, but you can wet down, you know, wet down the areas, just dampen it a little mm-hmm. bit to where you can sweep and it really keeps the dust down. And That's so a, a lot of times it's little things we think about, you know, for dust, that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, in bedding. It's, there's so many different ways yes. depending on the part of the country. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, they, yeah. And 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 that's exactly right. And so, you know, straw is probably not one of the things that's recommended uh, really for bedding for these horses. Now, you'll have horses that are not asthmatic that are not prone to being asthmatic. And you'll be fine with it, right? But we're talking mm-hmm. about the horse that coughs excessively, that has those clinical signs, or has been diagnosed with, with asthma. Uh, always a low dust. And, you know, what is that? And some of those aren't really, I'm going to say inexpensive, because sometimes it's chalk. You know, we talk about chalk paper. You talk about, you know, chalk up cardboard. Wood shavings are better. Uh, just no walnut wood shavings, okay? Yeah. No, that's a no-no in horses at all. So I want to make sure we said that. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah I agree. What about these new mattings that, um, you know, the, they're like the equivalent of six inches of, of shavings or whatever, you know, for those. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. And I think, you know, anything that we can do, regardless of the material, that is lower in dust and something we can clean around because, you know, the environment is always, uh, right. for these horses, kind of the trigger. And mm-hmm. sometimes the trigger will be a little, that's just not the only, but that's one of the bigger ones. You know, we're, we're, you know what we've kind of summarized there or talked about is a little bit is barn associated. Uh, depending on the part of the country you live, there's a pasture associated, you know, uh, for asthma horses and they'll be out. And the easiest thing for those horses, if you can, is, you know, like we said earlier, barn associated, you let them outside for the pasture associated, get them off the pasture, Yeah, <laughs> you know, get them away from the trigger. It's simpler, but you still have to t- take that horse and put it into a low dust environment. That yes, makes sense. it you know, does. Kind of some of the little things. That, and, you know, some of these aren't always that easy to, to do, but they're not that difficult. It's just little things thinking about that. You know, it's, it's the little things that, that tend to add up to something really big that can really make a big difference. Yeah, for and, our horses uh, too. Yeah, they, yeah, their noses are put in the wrong place, frankly. I, you know, they should be in their ears. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard to feed them so close to that nose and, and keep the dust away, I understand. But we do like them yeah. eating from, you know, a, a more prone nose closer exactly. to the ground if possible and uh you know i remember growing up the mangers were often quite high and you know horses were arcing their necks to get up in there i'm like uh that's not what we got into did i know so so right. yeah so you you are you know dealing with horses and uh, what we can do these are great tips for that too i i love I love the philosophy of your company and yourself, too. There was a, a statement that I read in, in your writings that said, we acknowledge that the health and well-being of animals is pivotal to the success and development of human life. Can you tell me about that? That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, full disclosure, I didn't write, obviously. Write, okay, you don't get credit. Statement. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, no, no. I won't take credit for something I didn't okay. do, yeah. but I didn't. But, I, you know, because I'll, I'll be honest, uh, when I look at that and to me, and I, I thought about it the very first time, because I think that to me, that statement, when you read it, means something different to every person or someone else can uh-huh. have. And for like me, I, I've got a bit of a, you know, personally to me, something like that, it's obviously equine. You could take this to, you could take cattle and then you could also, um, take this, you know, to our, you know, to, to dogs, dogs and cats. And cats and think, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, personally to me, I look at that and I think, well, I'll just tell you something else. Um, my son uh, is, um, he's autistic. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, uh, but uh, he's a junior in college doing well wow. and uh, just right on. So, I mean, uh, blessed in that, in that way. But, when when she was first diagnosed, and of course I already knew about this because I had seen some of these, you know, all this, uh, there's a lot of equine therapy, you know, for autism or autism spectrum, or even, 
you know, different behaviors or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I, you think about these horses, how the therapy, and he really gravitated toward that. Now we have a farm and had, but I, I could see where animals made such a big difference in, in his life growing up because he just, for whatever reason, innately just gravitated toward them and was very, very comfortable. And to be honest, I was I was kind of shocked. He had a bit of a horse sense or a cow sense or a dog sense, however you want to talk about it, just about him as a youngster. And I was, the, the way he moved, the things he did. But I, I think that behavior, you could just see a calming. So, I mean, to me, it's, uh, you know, I think all throughout his life, uh, they've been part of it. And I think that with him has, has even helped him because, like, you know, if he maybe get upset for something, then he was calm, yeah. always calm around animals. And so I think just personally, I, I look at that statement and I always think of that. And there's obviously other reasons how, how pets. And then to me, I think, you know, as a veterinarian and, and even as at, at the, uh, uh, you know, the, the things we're trying to do is promote the health of those horses so they can do that kind of work obviously you've got performance horses and everything else that everything horses do but they're able to fulfill that you know and hats off to all the people that that really take the time to you know work with those therapy horses and you know with those folks that that utilize those and so you know that's kind of our goal is regardless of whether uh how these horses are utilized or what that you know we're trying to do the right things to understand the right things about this to either prevent or, or manage whatever conditions these, you know, horses have. So we can kind of keep doing that. That makes sense. It makes beautiful sense. That's fantastic. Well, I support you. Um, we all do. Berger Ingelheim, family owned, which is really cool. Animal health Correct. company. Uh, yep. Here you are, you're granting money. This is where I read in a press release about your granting money to try to choose those that, really want to center on equine diseases and asthma syndromes. And um, and I just, I love that you and yourself, Dr. Grubbs, and also your company is leading the equine research in um, so many ways. And you can provide, I know that if people will go on your websites, um, you can provide additional educational resources. I know about equine health and, um, and the research that's going into it and, and the Generally, it generally just horse health, which is what our horse owners are interested in. So I hope people will go to that. Yeah, probably that since you just mentioned that if, if we're just looking like right at the research awards now, and that will take you, then you can go anywhere you want. Now, the research awards are not new. We've been doing that for I don't know, since 2010. Yeah, long for, for this particular program for a while. And a lot of a different topics, you know, we've not only um, looking at looking at respiratory uh, infectious respiratory disease and equine asthma syndrome, but other sometimes we will narrow it down to specific viruses. And we have a uh, a third party review board that are from different universities, uh, from private practice, and that helps you know that reviews these and uh, looks at these. And, and they're not, you know there's a support research. And also uh, at universities to help support uh, what we call a house officer, maybe a resident, okay? Because money sometimes is tough to come by for research. And so, you know, we're trying to help folks. I was a resident once, and so uh, not easy. So you have to look for a lot of places. And so, you know, we're trying to help that along. And sometimes it's maybe not respiratory. Maybe it's just equine infectious disease or maybe a particular virus. And we use our review board to help us, right? Pick topics that, that maybe aren't, maybe it's funded as much in other places. Mm-hmm. But, well, we need yeah. more good vets like you, Dr. Grubbs. Oh. I'm so happy that you're committed to this high ideal. And we're really right. honored that you would be on our show today and love to have you back. But, but love to do it. I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts. And I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it too on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. 
You can connect with other students online too, on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. Today, I want to start a little different format with you. Uh, Monty Roberts is going to be telling us a little bit about a famous horse that he was able to train, who was not so famous when he first met him. His name is Lomitas. He had won two races when Monty had met him, but he showed a lot of potential. They were very important races. The reason Lomitas has come up today is because we recently had a beautiful visit with a man by the name of Peter Shergan. Monty's going to talk to you a little bit about Peter, and um, you can also Google him. He's not only a famous jockey, uh, won some amazing races in his career, but he's also a now famous trainer, multiple, multiple trainers of the year, seven times at this point. But he has a fond, affectionate spot in his heart for this same horse, Lomitas, which is how Monty and Peter Shergan's life intersected. The important part for Peter is the horse Dane Dream, a filly, became one of the most important horses in his career. Had Lomitas not been in the lineage of Dane Dream, which he wouldn't have been if Monty hadn't been able to get him to the races. Dane Dream would have never been. But there are a lot of horses in that category, like Silvano and others that you'll hear in this interview with Monty, talking about Peter, Peter Shergan, his family, and the horses in his life. In 2004, Monty wrote a book called The Horses in My Life, and in it is a chapter titled Lomitas and the German Dynasty. When he wrote that book, he had no idea how deep that dynasty would become. At the publishing of that book, Lomitas' offspring had won nearly $8 million. That amount it has doubled, tripled, and even quadrupled for the Lomitas legacy. Uh, on October 1, in a Grand Prix race at the Lac de Triomphe in France, in Longchamp, there was a filly, Dane Dream who beat the boys and will be forever in the history books as winning by one of the longest margins in the history of the race. Her story could be an interview in itself. Uh, I would have loved to had Peter speak into the microphone too. His German is better than his English and our English is better than our German. So we left it for Monty to tell the story and here it is. So I want to tell you a story about an incredible horse and about the circumstances surrounding this incredible horse that are quite unusual in the racing world. The horse's name is Lomitas and he was owned by a very wealthy family in Germany, Jacobs, Jacobs if we read it in English, Walter Jacobs, Walter Jacobs, owned a horse called Lomitas. He had a farm, and that farm was in Bremen, Germany, near Bremen, Germany. And it had 30, 40 broodmares, and he was doing quite well. His trainers, and he had two of them, one was in the south of Germany and one in the north of Germany, and they trained traditionally. I'm not going to sit here and criticize them for the things that they did, but they did different than I did. And um, there were the typical circumstances of training right around the world at that time. Pretty much everybody doing about the same thing. And all of a sudden, in 1991, right after meeting the Queen and being told that I must go around the world, helping horses as much as possible and helping people to help horses in the absence of violence. So I get this call and they said, we have a horse here. His name is Lomitas. He was the champion two-year-old with two races, but they were two of the biggest races in Germany for two-year-olds. So he was the champion two-year-old. Then he spent the winter, let's say growing up, and being trained in a traditional fashion. 
I'm not going to criticize the trainers. They were doing what all the trainers were doing at that point in time. I'm not going to criticize the riders because they were doing what riders do at that point in time. And they had never heard of this cowboy from California called Monty Roberts. And they'd never heard of the things that he does without violence until he met the queen, Queen Elizabeth II, and then Vati Jacobs, Walter Jacobs, the owner of Lomitas, read some articles and saw things on TV, I guess, about this California cowboy that was training in the absence of violence and getting horses to do things that other people couldn't get them to do. So I got a call. And the call was from a trainer that had Lomitas in his barn. And he had an assistant trainer called Simon Stokes. And Simon Stokes could speak English, which was a big help to me because I didn't speak any Deutsch or German language. So they flew me over from here. I think they, they, they named a number that they were going to pay me to go, and I couldn't refuse to go because it was too much. But he would not go in the starting stalls. And when they did the things that they did, he would try to kill the people. Very, very aggressive. And at one race... He ended up lying on the turf while they ran the race right past him with three men in the hospital and a whole team of people beat up by this horse that wouldn't go in the stalls. And not only that, but there were horses in the stalls injured because they were in there fussing and fighting while they tried to get him into the stalls. And remember, he was owned by a multimillionaire that... They had to try, and he was a board member of all the racing associations, and they had to try to get his horse in the race. So I was led to the stable of this horse, and they, I, I remember it so clearly. They rolled the door back, and I saw the most beautiful thoroughbred you could ever imagine standing at the back of the stall and looking at me like I was had two heads. He had a wonderful young German lady groom that loved him and got along with him and he loved her. But when he went to the race, he didn't love anybody and he wanted to kill everybody. So I met him and I thought, wow, confirmation 9.9. I mean, nothing is perfect, but he was a 9.9. And his attitude was okay in the stall. I went in and I gave him a rub. He kind of looked at me with surprise, but the young lady that was handling him could handle him without any problem. And I said, what's the big deal here? And they gave him to me while they went out with a set of horses. And I took him to a little area that was a covered trotting ring for horses while they had bad weather in Bremen, Germany, a lot of the year. And so they would trot in this ring to give the horses exercise, and it had a roof over it. And I went in there, and I closed the gate behind us, and we were in this laneway about 12 feet wide, and I started to work with him. And suddenly, he seemed to realize that I was working with him to get him to do certain things, stop and back up and turn left and right and stuff. And all of a sudden, he said, no, no, no. You don't, you don't tell me what to do. If you start telling me what to do, I'm going to hurt you. And I remember that he backed up against the wall about 12 feet from me, and I'm against the other wall across this little laneway. And I said to myself, and I don't talk to myself, but I said to myself, Monty Roberts, you better get your work right because you're in the presence of greatness. Now, what did I know about 
greatness. Okay, so he won two races as a two-year-old. That's the end of his story. Greatness? I saw his shoulder. I saw his hips. I saw him move. I saw him think. I saw him make decisions about what I could and couldn't do. And I considered him to be something great. And you better get your work right. So I went to work. And the first thing I was going to do is getting to load on a truck because loading on a truck has some similarities to going into a starting stall. I mean, you have to put your feet in funny places and you have to climb this ramp and go in t- through a narrow door into a darker place and like that. And the, the trainer simply said, you can't get him to go in a truck, so I'm not going to get a truck for you. And I said, I came here to train this horse. And I want you to do, please, what's reasonable, get me a truck. He just rode off on his horse and went with another set. And Simon Stokes obliged me by calling on his phone and getting a truck sent to the racetrack there where they were training at Bremen Racecourse. And the truck pulled in and the trainer rode by and said, you'll never get him to go in there. Okay, and they went out and they were out there on the track with a set of horses for about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. And they're riding back and he's walking in the truck, walking in the truck. And the guy stops. So I remember that the name of the trainer was Andreas Wuller. And Andreas Wuller wasn't a bad guy. He just was... Traditional in every way that you could call tradition the training of horses on a racetrack. And I was just bringing Lomitas off the truck when he yelled at me, don't bring him off, don't bring him off. You will never put him back on. You can't take him off. You can't put him back on. We have to knock him out with drugs every time we put him on. And I said, please just move your horse there. I'm coming out, and I let him out. And I turned around and walked him back in. And Andreas Wuller said, oh, my God, what did you give him? I said, I didn't give him anything. And, I mean, it, it, it had been 20 minutes. And I could walk him in and out. Then we took him to a, a place where I thought they had a round pen. They said they had a round pen. And when we got there... They said, no, you make a round pen with the jumps. So I made a round pen with the jumps, nearly six feet high. And he made one round in my round pen and jumped out. And I said, look at this. He can do anything, this horse. And he was running in this big, you know, show ring, jumping ring. And I said, take down the round pen jumps and just put them in the corner And I did join up in this large arena with him. Those were days when I could jog a little bit and get around better. But he did a fantastic join up out there. And he was with me, walking, following me. And these guys that had been with him, their mouths just were dropping open. They couldn't believe what he was doing. This horse was so intelligent that he could read me and what I intended to do with him better than any human being could. They couldn't believe it, what they were seeing. So then we went back to the track, and the next day I was putting him in the stalls, in the starting stalls, that they couldn't get him in. Then they said, it's only because there's an audience out there and the, you know, the conditions of the races are there with other racehorses and stuff and everybody with the silks on, then he won't go in. Oh, but he would go in when you were home? Well, not really, but he would go in better at home. Well, yeah, when you're in a exciting place with all these things going on and strange people running here and there. Anyway, soon we had a race and it was right there at the same race course where he lived. And I recall so clearly that I said to Simon Stokes, I don't want any twitches on him. 
they put a twitch on him to go to the saddling paddock, a chain over the gums of his mouth, and um, all sorts of things, a whip behind him, whip beside him on each side, three guys with whips, would take him to the saddling paddock where he would fight them just to get the saddle on. And I said, I don't want any of that stuff. Leave the whips home, take the chain off his gums, and I do not want any pain to come to him, and his lady will lead him over. She was scared to death. She started crying. She said, he'll kill me. And I said, no, then I'll lead him over. So I led him over to the saddling paddock. I led him into the stall, which we had not practiced at all. I stood him on a long line and they saddled him without any problem. And then I had the lady, the young lady that was his groom, walk him around the walking ring. She had never done that before. They had three or four people on chains in his mouth before. And I just had a normal lead on him and I had her walk him around and he he did fine. And then we went out on the track and he warmed up okay, just like a normal racehorse would. And they started to line up down about three or 400 yards from the gate and all the jockeys start to line up and walk down toward the gate because they're instructed to by the director out there on the track. Now it's time for the race. So here they come down. And when they get down near the gate, I put a lead on him like you would normally do. Nothing in his mouth or gums or anything, just a, a normal lead on him. And I look over And all the jockeys are riding over to one end of the gate there and getting off their horses. And the trainers are there with the horses and the trainers are holding the horses and the jockeys are standing there in some sort of a conference. And I said to Simon Stokes, who was there with me, because both the trainer, Andreas Buhler and Stokes, were there because this was the last race before the Derby in Germany. And it was terribly important. So they were there. And I said, what's going on over there? I couldn't understand a word they were saying. In Deutsch. And But Simon, remember, he was born in England and he could speak English perfectly. And he could speak good enough German so that he could tell me they've boycotted the race. They, you got permission to put him in last. And they said they wouldn't go in the gate and allow him to be loaded last because they'd been there before and they had so much trouble while they fought this horse out behind and the horses inside were getting hurt and jockeys were getting hurt and they weren't going to do it. And I couldn't blame them. And I said to Stokes, I'm just going to lead him in. No, no, no. Vuler doesn't want you to lead him in. And I just kept walking and I let him in and stood in there with him. I stood in front of him in the stall and he was step fine. I rubbed his head and told him how nice he was. And the director of racing said, told the other jockeys, you get on now and you get. And so they did, boy. And in two minutes, the rest of them were in the gate and ready to go. And he won the race. Now, not only did he win the race but he became horse of the year in Germany and became a sire. And this brought out a lot of bad people. And they started to send through demands from Mr. Jacobs that he, they get money from him or else Lomitas is going to die. So I got another call. I had to go over and try to identify what's going on and maybe take him somewhere else. And when I got there, I told them who was doing it. And the reason I told them who was doing it was that the trainer next door to them on the track was very friendly with me when 
I was first there training the horse and the things I just described to you. And now that I went back, he wouldn't say a word to me, just rode by and looked the other way. I said, that's the guy that did this. And it turned out that it was the guy that did this. But he had a whole team of guys after him because they had taken money on bets and they were they owed the the gambling people money and they needed the money that they could get for advising Mr. Jacobs that they were going to poison him. And they sent him off to another race, which he won, but they poisoned him there. And he almost died, but he lived through it. And we took him to England and then to the United States. And he won at Santa Anita in the United States after spending time in England before shipping to the United States. He won at Santa Anita and then his feet just went wrong from the poison that they had given him. And we had to send him back to Germany to be a sire. And he was a sire. And I bought a mare here to send over with him. And Mr. Jacobs paid me and bought the mare from me to breed to him. And that first breeding produced Silvano, who became horse of the year globally and won the biggest race in Hong Kong. He won all over Germany, became horse of the year in Germany and six times the leading sire of Germany. And that mare produced four stakes winners from Lomitas, who became a champion sire after being a champion racehorse. Now, my entire time with Lomitas prior to his retirement, my entire time with him during his racing career was probably less than six or eight hours. And yet my principles of nonviolence were carried on by Simon Stokes, whom I will never forget how cooperative he was. He was a traditional trainer when I met him. You can bet on that. He was very traditional when I met him. But he will tell you he has not whipped a horse since he met me. He has not been in any way violent with a horse since he met me. And Lomitas, Silvano, and the mare's name was Spirit of Eagles. And she will go down in history as the best brood mare that Germany ever had. Can you imagine that? Those three horses and another couple that they sold for two and three million dollars will go down in history as the number one family that Europe has ever produced with a matter of a few hours of convincing people to take the violence out of the training of this particular horse. My wife, Pat, is a sculptress, and she did a sculpture of Lomitas. And one of Lomitas's first riders was a young man called Peter Sheergan. And Peter Sheergan has been an advocate of my methods now for all of these 25 years. He's been an advocate of my work and he's raised his children as advocates of my work. And he has two sons that are champion jockeys, one of which he sent me recently, Vincennes Sheergan, was with the Godolphin group and he was with me one month and it's changed his life. He's in Australia now and he will never be the same as he was going to be if he'd have stayed in the traditional world. Champion jockey and his older brother is a champion jockey now retired and is an executive with Coca-Cola company. Peter Shergan was here with his wife Gisela and uh, a younger son that I had never met before. In fact, the two jockeys that they produced, Vincent's and Dennis, I babysat with them while I was there working for Lomitas. And um, they became 
like stepsons or something close to me, almost family members. And Peter and Gisela have been good friends ever since. And I tell you that Simon Stokes is one of the best horsemen in the world today. I did go back for 26 years and spend a month organizing all of the youngsters to go where they were going to go to race and the conditions of racing. And they've produced 52 champions in those 26 years. That's an average of two champions per year. I don't believe that's ever been done by any organization before, including Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who has the largest operation in the world. I don't think that he's produced two champions per year for 26 years. Certainly not percentage-wise. He has hundreds of horses racing. While, in fact, the Jacobs family had 12 or 14 horses per year racing and two of them winning championships in any given year. It's absolutely incredible. And really, you know, it doesn't speak to me to be some genius or something. Don't, don't lay me accolade. I don't deserve it. I am an observer. The horses taught me. They were my teachers. And they said, you know, help us and let us do our thing. Show us what you want, but don't be violent with us. If you are, it will be less effective and I won't feel like winning races for you. It should be noted that Lomitas, while he was champion sire many, many times, his peak actually was with a mare called Dane Dream that won group one races in four or five different countries and was ultimately sold for a huge amount of money and went to Japan to be a broodmare there. Dane Dream was actually one of the greatest racing mares Europe ever produced by Lomitas, this wonderful horse that cooperated with me. It should be known that Peter Schirgen was a jockey on Lomitas during the most difficult times. And then he retired from riding in races and became a trainer. And he just visited us here in California. It was fantastic. His family, the youngest son, whom I didn't know, uh, particularly I might have known him as an infant, but I didn't know him particularly, was with them. And his wife, Gisla, was with them. And they've remained that kind of friend. But let it be known that Peter put in a starting stall like I invented uh, where you train horses to go in a kind of a circle, like a um, hallway system, I call it. And he has one on his place now. And he was here learning from me about the come along halter and things like that. And he has been seven times the leading trainer of Germany since I met him in 1991. A fantastic, not young man now, young by my standards, but he's um, in his early 60s or late 50s. And Peter Schurgen will long time be the leading jockey of of Germany, uh, seven championships is not even anybody close to that. So that's a very famous family. That's a wonderful family. And they have uh, done for racing what so many people have been trying to do. And they did it through the nonviolent techniques that I brought to Germany in 1991. It's one of the pride-making parts of my life um, that very few people even know about. And Peter Schurgen is not the kind of guy that goes around bragging about what he does or 
telling everybody where he learned it or anything like that. He's not an outgoing sort of celebrity type at all. But he's a wonderful man that has done a fantastic job and seven times the leading trainer of uh, Germany. Many times leading jockey too, but seven times leading trainer, which is far more difficult to do than the jockey thing. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the herd. Dear Monty, we are buying a horse trailer with living quarters and we're wondering if you could comment on the pros and cons of mangers. Monty's answer. It is important to take into consideration the purpose for which you are acquiring a trailer. Obviously, if you're a professional traveling a thousand miles a week or so and basically living on the road, then you and your horses have an entirely different set of requirements from the horseman who travels to the occasional trail ride or short distances to horse shows. There is nothing wrong with mangers. My assumption in formulating this answer is that we are discussing slant haul trailers. If you decide to include mangers, then it's best to choose a trailer with wider stalls. If you choose to put mangers in a narrower trailer and you have full-size horses, you could restrict their space unacceptably. For the hard-traveling professionals, mangers provide several advantages. They make it easier for you to feed and water your horses while on the move, and in addition, they allow for significantly more storage space than trailers without mangers, as most trailers will utilize the space below the manger for extra storage. I'm a spokesman for several types of trailers on a global basis, and many companies produce a manger that is safe and effective. Be very careful to use only mangers that are built from extremely strong material and constructed so that they have no areas that could injure a horse's leg. All edges should be smooth and all flat portions should be reinforced so that your horse cannot tear the metal. Many injuries occur when time and use is weak in the metal and cracks occur. Cracking in metal can be like a knife to the flesh of your horse. The feed compartment of a manger need not be more than five or six inches in depth and should have an outward sloping lip and rise to your horse closest. This construction will allow the horse to pull his foot out of the manger if he is silly enough to get it in there. You are probably aware that I am a strong proponent of slant haul trailers. If you have read my textbook, you will be aware that I recommend partial partition. I have also stated that I am a strong proponent of ramps as opposed to step-up trailers. Some of my companies produce trailers in accordance with my specifications. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says Get free horse tips. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in February of 2023. We have a mountain trail play day on February 4. We have a gentling wild horse course, five days, on February 6 through 10. We have an introductory course of horsemanship. February 13 through 25, and we have our introductory course broken into modules or taken as a two-week course. You can go February 13 to 15, which is the intro course module one, and that's the foundational steps to Monty's methods. Then you could do February 16 to 18, which is the course two, module course two, which is the join-up section. You get to learn the iconic join-up with lots of wonderful horses here. And then February 20 through 22 is the introductory course module three, and that is long lining. It's the next step after join-up to uh, condition your horse to turning left and right and backing up. It's really fun. And then if you've taken all three of those and are ready, you can do February 23 through 25 as the introductory course module four, which is preparation for the intro exams because you're moving on to certification. I love that. And then in March, we have March 11, Horsemanship 101. Super fun. And that one is super popular. So get in there right away if you're looking for a one-day fun trip, Solvang, California, Central California. We're dry here, by the way. I mean, we've had rain, but it's we're not washed away. We're we're actually functioning really well. And that's and that's 
again, March 11th, Horsemanship 101. Then March 13 through 17, we have Monty's special training. And that is way fun. That's all week with Monty working with the horses in an extended fashion, not just in one demonstration. He gets to work with the horse all week and put a lot of new tricks in that horse. And a lot of wonderful relationships are made on those Monty special trainings. And then March 18, we have a Mountain Trail Play Day. Didn't explain that when I said that in February 4. Mountain Trail Play Day is we put in a Mark Bullender obstacle course, and it's uh, competitive, and it's really fun. And so we don't want to hoard it, and um, the boarders get to use it. But one day a month, people can come and trailer in and try it out for themselves. It's a lot of fun, and the locals have been having a lot of fun coming to us once a month. And then in April, we have Oh, April 1st. It's really true, though. We have a mountain trail play day that day as well. And then April 10 through 14 is the introductory exams that we talked about. So if you're ready, you'll come. And then April 17 through 25, the ones that can get into the advanced exams, you know who you already are and you're planning to come. April 17 through 25, we look forward to meeting you there. You can see more at MontyRoberts.com. Check out his calendar or call the friendly people at 805-688-6288. And for today's details about our show, go to HorsemanshipRadio.com. You can find links and photos and more information about our guests. And we love your feedback. So you got to follow us on Facebook or Twitter or maybe Instagram, and that would be Facebook.com forward slash Monty Roberts. Twitter, we follow along at forward slash Monty underscore Roberts. And Instagram, my favorite because it's beautiful, is at Instagram.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts forward slash. That's a lot. Jen usually reads this stuff. This is hard to do. Many thanks to our sponsors too. And that is handsongloves.com. Love them. And MontyRobertsUniversity.com. That is our reason for being. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network too at www.horseradionetwork.com. And until next time, have many happy horse hours. Oh, 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 oh,